All right, thanks for being here. I, uh, I've been asked to uh, moderate this, and nobody gave me any guidelines or limitations. So uh, that's a harbinger of trouble, as you know. Uh, I'm going to start with two innocuous questions, and then I want to get into some controversial stuff. So let me ask the two innocuous questions of each of you, and uh, just ask you not to filibuster, because we need time for the controversial stuff. So. All right, yesterday, John, you said that humility is the key to enduring faithfulness. And then Dr. Ferguson said, likewise, that uh, the two sins that undermine faithfulness and, and cause more ministerial downfall than anything else are laziness and pride. So you both agree that uh, humility is, is vital. And uh, I, watching you, John, for 36, 37 years, I would say discipline is also one of the secrets of your of your uh, longevity. And so here we have a panel of some of the most disciplined, productive, prolific, non-slothful panel. And uh, so let me ask each of you two questions, and you can, you can answer them. We'll start with Mark and just go that way, okay? First, what's the secret to being disciplined in your time management? And second, in light of the influence that you have and the fact that so many people listen to you, how do you resist the temptation to pride. Uh, I don't think I have any wisdom about a secret on discipline. Uh, I mean, I'm uh, I'm I'm rigorous on the first thing every morning in my entire life is reading the Bible and praying. It just does not shift. Everything else pretty much shifts. Uh, when did you start that habit? Pretty much after I was converted as a teenager. I mean, it just you know. Uh, and as far as pride, you know, that's the kind of question people who are far away from you ask and look at you sitting on a stage answering questions. Uh, I don't think there's a member of our pastoral staff at church who'd say, hey, Mark, why are you not like swollen with pride? Because, I mean, they see all the stuff I'm dealing with all the time. They see how imperfectly I deal with it. They know the challenges at church that I, I don't know the answer to. They know the, the difficult email I got this morning and the difficult email, I'm not sure, what, what do we do with this person? So it's, I think, in, you know, okay, so what would cause me to be more prideful personally? Uh, I would tend to value too much uh, positive comments from these brothers. So if it's Phil or Lig or Al or Sinclair or John, I, if they say something sweet to me, I could chew on it like a dog on a bone. We can fix that. Well, <laughs> thank you, brother. <laughs> but, that, you know, that that would be... That would be more a live temptation, I think, for my soul. Phil, I've always wanted to be more disciplined. I do think that in pastoral ministry, I had to learn early on just to survive what had to be done and what I didn't have the capacity to do. And so I, I tell people the first thing that I ask myself uh, when I start the day is, um, you know, what am I going to ignore? And, and so deciding what you don't have time for and that you must ignore not that, that there aren't worthy things to do in that list is really important for a pastor and uh, I, I always have tried to make sure that it's my it's my local pastoral work that's the most important thing not not you know platform stuff and things of that nature but the local pastoral work is most important with regard to humility we were talking uh, back in the room before we came in <laughs> The Lord knows my heart and, and he knows my need to be humbled and he has very effective ways that he has. Now, I'm, I'm very serious about it. You know, I, he has very effective ways of getting at me and I take that as an indication of his love for me uh, that I, I, I really, I, one of the things I've loved over the years is that my congregation actually, most of them have no idea what I do outside of the congregation. I, I came back from a T4G on one occasion and was delighted to know that a congregation member that I was having a conversation with had no idea what T4G was. That was, I was not a big deal because I had spoken at T4G. Right. And so, and I loved that. that my, all my congregation knows I get up on Sundays and I preach God's word. And so that's a wonderfully settling kind of thing. Just one question about what you said earlier that you, uh, you get up and decide what to ignore. Yeah. 
Are you like me and you lean to ignoring the odious tasks and doing the ones that are more pleasant? Or Yeah, that, that's really good. No, I, I have, uh, b- because um, I do not relish and enjoy conflict, I know that sometimes my pastoral duties in going towards conflict, especially in local church work and in relational work where I'm not going to be the hero is really important for me to do. So there there are times when I sit down with a family and I know that no matter what I say, either one or the other or both of them are not going to like me when that conversation is over with. But I know I've got to have it because I'm their pastor and I'm the only one who can have that conversation with them. And so I try and make sure that it's not that kind of thing that I'm slip, you know, sort of shoving off into the don't have time for it category. Right. I've yeah. heard John say frequently that... Uh, he does the most difficult task first, and then everything else seems right. easy. I am, I think, the most disciplined person I know. <laughs> and, and, and the, the most humble. And the most effective. Um, and I have n- no problem with pride. I, uh, <laughs> I, I look down upon the rest of humanity in pity. Um, Hey, I listen to you every morning on the briefing. I know how true that is. Uh, uh, no, thank you for the question. I, I will tell you that I, 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 my life is multiphasic, multidimensional. All of our lives are. And uh, the one thing I just want to tell people, young guys ask me this all the time. I just want to say, I, I can honestly say that almost no day of my life has gone as I planned. Um, when you are a pastor or you're a CEO or president of an organization of any size, nothing goes the way I play. I mean, I'm here on schedule at this event, but my entire, the hours preceding this, nothing went basically as I had planned. So I've had to figure out uh, how to make things happen when there is no scheduled time for it. Uh, so, I mean, thankfully, I was driven from the hotel here. I was working on the briefing the whole time, you know, just in the, I was waiting in the, you know, working on it until the very last minute to get in the car and work on it there. I think an awful lot of ministry is going to be that way. You have to have, given what we do, especially in the preaching of God's Word, you've got to have serious protected time. But that might not come as you are strategic. It, it might come as you're desperate. And uh, you just have to make it happen. And then you just have to decide, what am I not going to do that otherwise looks important and, uh, and not do it? Humility. I, I, uh, I'm going to talk on Luther in the session that comes following. And, and you know, Luther and pride, very interesting thing. Uh, Luther found it a lot easier to deal with pride once he was married. <laughs> Amen to that. He found it easier thereafter when he had children. <laughs> he found it easier after that when his children became teenagers. And uh, I will simply tell you, in life, and like Mark said, the people around you, you know, you, 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 can't, you cannot afford pride when you are surrounded by people who are intimately involved in your life and your ministry. And uh, I think that's a big issue. I think where, where I see, I mean, pride's obviously, uh, uh, I, I agree with Augustine, it's, it's, it's the first sin uh, to be as God. Uh, and it's always there. But uh, we have the correctives of the means of grace. We also have the correctives of God's people as they are around us. And the closer, are, closer they are to us, the less lightly uh, we can... If we surround ourselves with sycophants, um, then that's a huge problem. But that's the, not much of a risk if you hire the right people and surround yourself with the right people. One follow-up on the discipline issue. I have heard from numerous people that you do a lot of work in the small hours of the morning that you're frequently up at 3 a.m. working. Yes. I'm not suggesting that. I, I'm, I'm not, but that, that's what I mean by desperation. I mean, finally, fewer people interrupt me between 11 o'clock at night and 3 in the morning. Uh, that turns out to be important. And so I, but I don't, I don't, I'm not, that's the reason I'm a little, a little reluctant to talk about some of these things because it only sounds like prescription, which I'm not. Right. Uh, prescribing. It's just, uh, in many ways, the only way I can get things done that must be done. So if we ask you to give a typical, what a typical day was like, you, you'd say there is no typical day. It's just really long and complicated every day. Right. Yeah. 
I get that. But, but let me be clear. What I do in those late night hours is the study I need for my soul and for my preaching um, because I need that uninterrupted and quiet. And so you just, I just have to make that happen when, because that's generally incompatible with the other kinds of job description issues we hold. Dr. Ferguson, thank you for your message, by the way, yesterday. That was really good. Well, as to the first question, I am very slothful. Um, and I, I don't believe it. No, uh, I am very slothful. Um, and it's that that makes discipline such a necessity to me. Um, I, would, I would sink into being a couch potato without it. Um, it makes me feel good to hear you say that. I just have a hard time believing well, it. Well, it's not my aim in life to make anybody feel good. <laughs> um, to feel humble, maybe, but, but not to feel good. So, I, I, you know, I've struggled with that uh, all of my life. Um, but the recognizing I've needed to struggle with it has been a huge help to me because I think it has actually help me to be productive. So, so that's one thing. As already has been said, marriage and family, you know, that's who you are and where you are. Um, you know, I don't think it's possible to live in a normal family with, with a, a faithful wife and children and be strutting around because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're just this woman's husband and these children's dad. Um, and I think that also... You know, and being enmeshed in the life of a congregation, um, that they, um, you know, what what helps you is that they, as Dr. MacArthur was saying the other day, they love you because of the office that you have. And another thing that I think, you know, I think has been a help to me is when I learned that I was the person who most of all was sitting under my own preaching. And that that was the explanation why um, God kept telling me through my preaching, you are really making a complete jawbone of this. And it's only by my grace that anything is being fed to these people. Um, and that, that's been a huge, that was really an amazing moment of insight to me when I learned that that this ministry would, would keep me down and that that was the explanation of much of the emotional experience I would go through before, during, and after. Like the message yesterday was a nightmare for me to prepare uh, for all kinds of reasons. It just was, and I don't often find this, but it was just so difficult for me. But eventually you learn, hey, this is this is not just about them. This is about you in order that it may be for them. And so I, personally, I've found actually being called to the gospel ministry, uh, recognizing that if you're a minister of the gospel, you live within concentric spheres of responsibility, and that as you understand, as it were, the values of those responsibilities, things do begin to fit into place. And then one of the things I think probably you learn to do is to is to redeem the intermittent blocks of time to become more and more creative in them and i think you know as al was saying i think you know all of us have got to learn to do that in terms of how we ourselves are wired and you couldn't you couldn't prescribe yourself for anybody else are you able to do that when you're writing, like redeem those little blocks of time? Because my experience, writing requires you to set everything else aside for long periods. Yeah, I have a very short attention span, especially about my own writing. <laughs> um, so I, I work in everything in bursts. I work in sermon preparation in bursts. When I was in the church and maybe preaching, you know, four or five messages a week, I would begin the week with four or five pads. And if I wasn't getting anywhere in half an hour, I would go on to something else. But I wouldn't prescribe that to anybody else. It's just the, 
It's just what I realized worked for the way in which I was wired. John. <clears throat> Excuse me. I appreciate everything you all have said. Uh, I don't think about self-discipline ever. Um, uh, I, I don't say to myself, you need to do this. You've got to get up out of your chair and go do this. Um, I don't say, oh, tomorrow I've got to do this, that. Um, I don't even think about self-discipline. Uh, everything for me is just a habit. And habits have just taken over my life, so they're almost unconscious. Uh, no, nothing is difficult. In, in this, I mean, the task may be difficult, but getting at it is not. It's just the most natural thing for me to do what I've done for so many years and what I know I need to do. So uh, I think it might be encouraging because some of us, all of us, including myself, would feel like we don't have, we haven't mastered the art of self-discipline. But you, you, would, you would find it almost impossible to live your entire life if you had to fight for self-discipline every day. But what happens is, as you begin in your ministry, you set habits. If they're good habits, you'll spend your whole life benefiting. If they're bad habits, you'll spend your whole life trying to get out of them. So it's critical when you're young in ministry to establish good habits. And one of the habits that, that I determined that I would establish when I first came to Grace Church was to spend you know, 25 to 30 hours a week in sermon preparation. And that, I did that for six months, and I've done it. It's on, it's on autopilot. It's just it's what I do. Uh, it, it, it's not a fight to do that. It would be a fight not to do it. I, mean, I, wouldn't, I, don't, I don't like empty space in my life feeling unproductive. But we all have the ten, ten, I mean, we all need to break down a little bit and relax, but uh, I, I'm in the habit of being as productive as I can. And even if I'm not doing a task, I'm reading to front load myself for what's coming down the road. So I'm never away from the, the groove. Uh, as far as the humility issue goes, uh, it, is, it is a horrendous iniquity to be proud. The Lord hates a proud heart. So you, you have to win the battle with pride in your heart. It, you, that, that is, that is, a, that is a, a, a sin of the heart that won't stay contained. You know, it'll conceive in the heart, but eventually it'll lead to death. So you have to win that battle on the, in the inside. <clears throat> and as the, the men have said, family makes a huge contribution to that. Um, especially if you're a preacher, because my wife thinks I should live everything I say all the time. <laughs> There's, the woman has no mercy. Right? <laughs> you get it. And my kids and the people close to me, um, expectations of the people you love are, 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 are wonderful. They, they, they force you into reality. And, and as, as far as being a pastor goes, you, I've lived with 50 years of my shortcomings staring me in the face for half a century. Um, the failures are there as well. Uh, so the, being a pastor of a church over a long period of time is living in reality. I, I mean, it's reality. I'm not leaving town to go talk to faceless, nameless people. Um, they're all around me. So I think uh, the, the congregation uh, confronts you with your strengths and your weaknesses as well. And, but, but I think it's just a, it, it's a sin that has to be dealt with, and it's dealt with by the Word and the power of the Spirit and humbling your heart before the Lord. All right, so let me ask some more difficult questions. You all have been friends for longer than two decades, and there haven't in those years been very many things that you've disagreed on publicly, but now there is with the social justice issue. And uh, so I wanted to ask some questions about that. And um, uh, let me start with you, Al, because uh, you've said something that I've thought of often, I think it's, it, it, it's a really good insight, and that is that uh, sort of a, the leftward drift, the liberalizing drift that affects not only politics but theology happens incrementally, but any reformation towards the right happens exponentially. 
Are, are you not concerned at all about the liberalizing drift of the social justice movement and all the rhetoric that goes along with that? I'm sure you are. Yeah, the only offense I take at that is that I talk about this five times a week for 25 minutes. Well, so uh, let me let me give you my perspective on that because uh -huh. you do you <laughs> don't take offense, but <laughs> you I do listen to you every morning. You have opinions on everything in the news, but when it comes to uh, the evangelical movement and yeah. the social justice issue, particularly, I'm not talking about uh, you know what happens in the world of politics, but I'm talking about what happens among our constituents and the mm -hmm. rhetoric that's going on in places like T4G and and the Gospel Coalition. Uh, you have been remarkably silent. It's one of those issues where uh, I've only heard you speak on it in the ask anything it sections yeah. when. People ask you questions like I'm doing right now. And yeah, I think the pushback is I think that's what my whole life is speaking about. I mean, I, I began, I mean, all my public ministry began dealing with these questions. So I do take a bit of offense, not personally, but I mean, I just, I, I am not going to be forced into uh, a Twitter conversation, 140 characters about these issues. Uh, I have been trying to lay out for 30 plus years, an understanding of how evangelicals should engage the culture. And uh, I mean, I cut my teeth apologetically uh, confronting cultural Marxism and uh, I mean, the, the entire network of issues of the left. Uh, you look at who I invite to my campus, you look at who I cite, you look at who I uh, platform, uh, I feel pretty good about the message uh, that I'm sending there. Uh, when it comes to uh, concerns about the evangelical left, absolutely. I, ha I, I mean, I'm, I have been quite vocal. And anyone who knows the conversations amongst evangelical leadership knows exactly where I am on these issues. How best to articulate that concern in this particular moment, that's not easy. That's not easy. And I have tried to help to interpret uh, these issues as clearly and biblically and charitably as I can. I'm afraid we're going to lose an enormous number of, uh, of evangelicals uh, to uh, various kinds of social gospel because that's a lot easier to find satisfaction in than evangelism. And, uh, and, and so, again, I look at, look at what I do on my campus, look at who I platform, look at the issues I write about. Um, knowing exactly how to, uh, how to help younger evangelicals figure these things out, uh, which is actually my job as a seminary president, that, that's not real easy. Uh, and I will confess that. But I'm trying to be as clear as I can be on this. I, I mean, for years, I mean, this has been the great concern. T4G was largely created out of the concern that there was confusion over what the gospel is. Right. And uh, confusion, and, and by the way, we, I will acknowledge to you that, uh, that there are clarifications that T4G needs to make with my partners sitting here uh, and will make. I won't get too personal about that, but, and, and I also don't want to, just pick on you, so uh, I'll, sk I'll skip over my next question, which was going to be, why didn't... I don't mind it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, ju I, I just want to respond as honestly as I may. Right. But you didn't sign the statement on social justice and the gospel, the Dallas statement. None of you did. So let me just ask the three of you, uh, how far apart are we on this? Uh, are we from you or are we from each other? Well, let's say... <laughs> Let's not make me the focus. Let's talk about John MacArthur. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, Phil, suggest an issue you think there would be a difference on. Well, that's what I'm asking. What, well, that's uh, what I'm asking you. Right, so <laughs> let's take the Dallas, the Dallas statement. What well, that's in a very there? broad statement. So, I mean, pick an uh, issue It's you pretty think. specific. But no, specific would be about one particular issue. Like, yeah, like what, one of the points in that statement. Well, or affirmative action. I mean, that's an example that I often use. I mean, there's a specific issue, you know. 
But I'm just trying to say, what, what would it. be, what would be, what's the difference that you're seeing between John? Yeah, let me let me jump in and just say this: that um, I don't think there's any difference theologically w with where we all stand, I mean, we've we've navigated that together on every possible platform in every situation. Um, how how we respond to the culture around us and the pressures that come on us from the culture, how we navigate those relationships that face us. Um, yeah, I get a lot of, um, and even with this uh, shepherd's comments coming up, I got a lot of heat from people on the internet who I, I, I don't, somebody has to show it to me because I don't, I don't go there, um, but that, that you were going to be here because you, you may have expressed yourself differently uh, on the issue of social justice or, or whatever other issue it might have been. Um, that seems to be the, the buzz button anyway. And I said, look, um, these are my friends. These are men I love. These are, these are men who serve Christ. They've given their life to him. They, God has given each of you guys a formidable place in the kingdom, and you've all had an impact on my life. I'll fight error, but I don't fight my friends. Why would I do that? I don't want to become an island. I mean, my enemies have already eliminated me. If I get rid of my friends, I may have nobody but Phil. <laughs> that would be a, a sad state of affairs. <laughs> no, no, actually, my question is, because you, you, you declined to sign the statement, what in it would you consider to be wrong? Well, just for me personally, I decline to sign almost every statement. If you've ever seen me sign a statement, there's a story behind that. I'm just not a big say, statement signer guy. So I, I, don't, I didn't memorize the statement. I did, okay. I did read Fair the enough. statement. I read an earlier draft of the statement that I had a number of disagreements with. When the final statement came out, it was much better. I would certainly be in broad sympathy with the statement. If there are particular sentences in there I don't agree with, I don't remember what they are. Okay. I remember Al told me one time after a statement you did sign. I don't know if you remember and this. You shouldn't have. <laughs> and right. I didn't you because said, I don't sign statements. I will statements. never sign another statement. Trying to hold fast to that <laughs> pledge. Uh, Phil, you asked. I want to be very honest. I, yeah, go ahead. I, you've known me for a long time, so you know of my concerns. I am having before God to try to address those concerns the way I think best, consistent with 35 years of public ministry. So I was not particularly appreciative of being handed a statement. So the first question was about pride. I don't want this to be pride, but I had no opportunity to offer any particular consultation or suggestion. It's not pride of authorship, but I am just reluctant to sign on to anything that's not creedal and confessional um, that, uh, that doesn't express exactly how I would want to say something. Not signing should not be interpreted as a rejection of common concern. I don't think that's right. fair. I don't think, I think you understand that. Of course. Would you agree though that over the past three, four years, there has been a, a, a dramatic acceleration of rhetoric about this issue, social justice, and that historically it has had a, a, a very strong liberalizing tendency, right? I think you get a yes and a yes from me on that. So why wouldn't uh, Together for the Gospel and the Gospel Coalition, two organizations that were founded in the wake of the emerging church who, who were using social justice rhetoric themselves, uh, to, to clarify the gospel, why wouldn't, why wouldn't the stress be to say, look, we're not trying to add to the gospel here or, or clarify the fact, because there are people uh, some of the most outspoken people on the social justice side who are saying, look, this is the gospel. I, and one famous author said he didn't really understand the gospel until he was woke. 
that was, uh, well, I don't know that I want to say the name, but. I'm going to look at brothers for Ligan, a moment. you're the representative of Big Eva here. I mean, uh, you're, you're on the board of directors of the Gospel Coalition. Um, Phil, my concern, and we talked about this a little bit in the room behind, my concern in this whole discussion is I've, I've watched over the last, if I can give a quick tour of the last 50 years, in the, in the late 1960s, I don't think a lot of us realized it, but a reformed awakening was beginning in multiple denominational settings, Baptist, Presbyterian, Congregational, Bible Church, and around the world. Um, this man was a part of that. He's one of the important streams in that worldwide reformed awakening. Um, I think that through, I think we began to realize this in the 1980s and 90s. We, we realized that the battle for the Bible had been led by people with big God theology. And we suddenly started finding one another. <laughs> And it was like, wow, there's somebody else that thinks like me and loves these great biblical truths and wants to herald them to the ends of the earth. And I think for the, for the first 40 or so years of that awakening, it was that experience over and over again as we, as we saw that, ex, that awakening spreading into remarkable places like having reformed Mennonites. I mean, Menno Simons is spinning in his grave right now. There are Calvinistic Mennonites and Quakers and, you know, all, and, and all sorts of things like that. Then, I think beginning somewhere around 2010, in a cultural shift in our own setting, and there are a lot of factors in there, uh, I, I think what we started seeing is a fissure, and it's a denomination, it's a uh, generational fissure, especially, in terms of how are we going to interface with a culture? And how are we going to deal with a culture that is increasingly antagonistic to Bible-believing Christianity? And we started to see generational differences in how to deal with that. Now, we're all of one part, one side of that generational divide. One of my concerns in this whole range, I mean, there, there are all manner of things that everybody on this platform would rule immediately out of hand as legitimate from a biblical standpoint under the, under the broad rubric of social justice. You know, for instance, LGBTQIA rights and affirmation is, is conceived broadly as an absolute bedrock commitment of social justice. Right. Women's roles in the church as well. All of us are in lockstep agreement on that. And in fact, my concern on racial issues is that I do not drive our grandchildren into the arms of the LGBTQIA issue, uh, where, where already our younger people don't want to touch that, that issue because they know that it immediately marginalizes them. So one thing I want to make sure I do is I want to look hard at my own tradition and my own tradition's failures with regard to the communion of the saints, the image of God in man, um, loving our neighbors, and, and look hard at where we failed, own up to that, so that I don't, uh, you know, you know the argument that's out there. Uh, the church's failure in LGBTQIA area, not to affirm it, is just like its failure in the area of slavery and, and segregation. I want to break that argument apart. And I want to say slavery and segregation was a failure of biblical fidelity. Caving into LGBTQIA uh, affirmation is also a failure of biblical fidelity. And when I, where I'm standing, I'm standing there because I'm standing on the Bible. And not because I'm trying to curry the favor of the culture, but because I want to tell the church, don't seek the favor of the culture. And that means you have to say no to the culture where it's wrong. And then you can say yes to the culture where it's right, not because the culture said it, because the word said it. And you're not, you're, you're, you're not trying to get cultural affirmation out of the culture. If anybody in here who wants cultural affirmation, you're going to lose. 
I mean, you, you, you can't throw enough over the side of the boat to get the culture to love you. You have to throw God over the side of the boat to get the culture to love you. So please, if anybody in here wants the culture to love you, you're, go ahead and become an atheist now. I mean, it's, that's not going to work. So what, what I want us to do is look rigorously at these issues from a biblical standpoint, and I want us to make sure that we make a case for the big God theology that we've been all a part of this movement of for the last 40 years to this next generation, which is already wavering on a whole range of cultural Wouldn't issues. Wouldn't you agree, though, that the, that desire to get the culture to love and appreciate us is a pathological cancer on the evangelical movement, on Big Eva? I mean, that's, I would say, perhaps the, the defining mark of uh, Big Eva. Uh, I, I, I definitely see that there, Phil. I also, as, as, as a pastor, um, when, when I see someone drifting in a dangerous direction, um, I want to use the arguments against them that are the most convincingly piercing as to the actual motivations of their hearts. And I actually see several distinct motivations in operation. And if we simply say the only reason this is a discussion is because of currying the favor of the culture, I think we won't be persuasive. Because I think there, there are some people that are genuinely, though mistakenly, motivated that need to be gotten at in a slightly different way. So I certainly, even in my own backyard, I do look out and I see sometimes oh, brother, you so want the affirmation of the world. What do you all think is the future of this discussion? I mean, what is the end game? The, the Southern Baptists, for example, have, uh, I think at every major convention for the past decade, have uh, asked forgiveness for slavery and their stance on it originally. How, how long is this going to continue to be an issue that's at the center of our, our discussion? Just to be clear, I, I don't think that's accurate about the Southern Baptist Convention. Really? No, not at all. When uh, was the first time they... Uh, 95. 95. Okay. So for more than 20 years. There's what, 150 what are you years asking before us that. to do? Undo there was 150 it? years before that that weren't no, so No, no, I'm saying... It, it, does, it have to be, does that have to be renewed? It hasn't ever all? been renewed. Okay. I'm not I sure mean, you, you're mistaking to. someone speaking from the microphone at the Southern Baptist Convention for an action of the Southern Baptist Convention. Any messenger can get up and get to a microphone and say anything. Okay. And how long will that continue? Well, until Jesus comes or the Southern Baptist Convention turns off all the microphones. <laughs> uh, that's, that's it. But, I mean, there, there, are, there are issues. So if you, if you take the whole social justice issue and realize the poisoned well that comes from, uh, which is uh, basically the reduction of everything to structural issues. Uh, it's a more traditionally Marxist argument that, uh, with variant forms that aren't so explicitly Marxist, but are based upon the fact that morality is not the central issue, but structural issues are the, are the central issue. Um, if you take that out and biblically let's, let's critique social justice, then we've got justice. And, uh, and that's where in, there are going to be ongoing discussions that are unavoidable about what biblical justice requires of us. Uh, and, and so I, I, when you say, where is this going? Uh, I, I don't think there's any way to avoid a lot of these questions. And I don't think any of the people who think they're avoiding them are going to avoid them for long. Uh, one way or another, uh, I mean, we, we, our answer to social confusion cannot be, we're not going to talk about this. And uh, especially on an issue like racism, I mean, I'm confronted with the reality that take social justice out of it. I've got simple justice issues, uh, biblical justice issues that are very close to home. Uh, I've got to deal with. Uh, sometimes we don't deal with them until they're brought to our attention. So... Um, that kind of public uh, kind of public airing on various issues is going to continue. I think if we are not biblical and honest about the reality of simple, straightforward biblical justice issues, uh, then um, then we're going to be seen as incredibly hypocritical when we do stand for a biblical understanding of sexuality and gender and marriage and, uh, frankly, the exclusivity of the gospel and the ontological trinity and uh, the inerrancy of Scripture. 
Um, I don't think there's any way to avoid these. And that's where, again, I'm going to go back and say, this is what I've tried to talk about and do in public, thinking out loud in public uh, for 35 years. And uh, I'll stand on that body. Uh, I'm thankful there are very few things I've had to go back and revise uh, in 35 years. There's a consistent argument. And, and by the way, when you're talking about the briefing, it's not just about politics. I deal deeply no, with the that. life of, of denominations, including my own, with theological issues, uh, with, uh, with the entire spectrum of the culture. So I intend to keep on doing that. Uh, but I hope to do so absolutely consistently and absolutely biblically with fidelity. And I invite you and all others to interrogate every aspect of my life and show me where I may come short. I've been a Christian since the 70s, and it seems that there have been major threats to evangelical core convictions that come in waves. We had the inerrancy battle. Uh, There was pragmatism in the seeker-sensitive churches, the emerging church movement, and, and several others that I've kind of skipped over. What would you see as the looming threats to our shared convictions? Well, I'm trying to say I uh, agree with you about much of what you see as the looming threat, uh, but I'm 60 almost. My wife is not happy when I'm saying Morty 60, but I'm in my 60th year. Men round up, women round down. Uh, age, I mean, just in terms of uh, 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 how that works. <laughs> but uh, I have lived long enough to remember that when I came of age as an evangelical, this was the same discussion. And it was being driven by the evangelical left, people like Jim Wallace and Sojourners, the Sojourners community. They're still there. Uh, Yes, but the difference is they have followed the consistent logic of their own position, and they have been pulled. I mean, they're no longer theologically orthodox, nor any semblance thereof. and, And they've been left behind by the culture. Well, yes, yes, exactly right. They can't get left enough, you know. Well... Yeah, I, I, I think you may need to update yourself on where they are. I think they They're are trying. actually, uh, in many ways, uh, there. They're unneedful to the left now. They serve, Except they as a political to coalition. Except as a political coalition to the left. But the reality is the same thing is a danger that I see looming, uh, and I'm quite concerned about it, trying to address that as best I know how. The difference is this. Um, and I debated Jim Wallace uh, in person. The difference is this. Jim and others, J- Jim will speak as an evangelical, and, uh, uh, but, but they don't want to get very specific in theology. One distinctive, is, which is a part of our challenge right now, is that there are people who will agree with every point of our theological system who are not seeing the other issues the same way. That's requiring a different kind of apologetic argument. Does that make sense? It does. It does. But I, I go back to what you said about uh, incremental changes that, that promote that sort of liberalizing tendency and, and realize that just last year at both the Gospel Coalition and Together for the Gospel, I was hearing some rhetoric that actually I first heard from Jim Wallace and Sojourner's 20, 30 years ago. And so I think what I'm asking you is, uh, in fact, what I am asking you is, do you not see that that the evangelical movement, even even our constituency, the most conservative end of the evangelical movement is becoming a little more susceptible to that? But Phil, you've known me for a long time. You know the answer to the question is yes, but I'm not going to be forced into a situation before thousands of people in which I have to say I'm going to do it your way. Sorry. Okay. No, I'm just not. And if that's Fair a test enough. of fellowship amongst us, yeah, this will be a good time to find out. Let, yeah. let, me, let me jump in and just say, um, there's no question about our, our biblical commitment. No question about the fact that we're anchored deep in theology. No question about the fact that we want to care for the people who suffer, right? I mean, that, that's part of being Christian. The confusion comes when people keep identifying other groups of people as those who suffer. And we have all these new people to deal with who don't really suffer, but there's a category created for them which makes them a suffering 
group, and we're trying to figure out how do we deal with that. I don't have a problem with helping poor people or helping people who suffer, dealing with, uh, I mean, I've had a lot of experience in, in the South. and I, I don't have any, any problem with the church reaching out in love and lifting up these people. But if, if they keep creating new groups who are identified as those who are disenfranchised, suffering people, they, they put the evangelical church in a really odd place because now you've got, you've got all the Me Too people, you've got all the LGBTQ people, and who knows what, the transgender people, and they keep identifying groups of suffering people, uh, and at some point, we have to make a biblical sta- a stand. We have to say, well, wait a minute, and, and, and you, you all know that. We all know that. Um, but I think to the culture and to some more liberal people, they, they think we're stopping short of where our Christianity should take us, right? We ought to embrace all these groups. I can hardly keep up with all of the, the new ones that are appearing on the surface. So I think for us to find our way to real suffering people dealing with real issues and love them in Christ and care for them and lift them up and maybe provide things for them that they haven't had in the past in the name of Jesus Christ is fine. But I can't become a victim of every new group that this culture invents uh, for reasons that have very little to do with helping people and have to do with political power. Next question. <laughs> you leave me speechless. You want a quick anecdote? Yeah, go ahead. I was coming out to California on Thursday, and your most well-known member of Congress was two rows in front of me. And because I was sitting next to a friend of hers, she came back and talked with me and Logan a number of times. And the first thing she said to me was, oh, terrible about that Methodist vote last night. Well, I, of course, was delighted about the Methodist vote last <laughs> night. So what was I to say? Well, I didn't really say anything. I just let her keep talking. Uh, But I did try to do more long-term undermining stuff by giving a copy of Greg Gilbert's book, Who is Jesus, that Logan was reading. And he actually had all his underwritten and everything in there. And I just took it anyway. And um, (laughs) gave gave it to another member of Congress who was sitting there, who is uh, from your fair state and of your fair party, uh, I just generally refer to that as the Fair Party of California. You understand right. what I'm yeah, referring to? It. And, um, you know, I think she is going to, I pray she reads it and that we can have a more substantial conversation than just a kind of Twitter level exchange. I, I'm with Al. I don't think a lot's going to be sorted out through those kinds of quick exchanges. And I appreciate you're trying to have thoughtful, honest conversation here in public. And I, and I appreciate that, Phil. All right. Let me ask this. Uh, what gives you, let me ask, I'll go down the line, each of you can say this. As you look at the evangelical landscape today, what gives you the most hope? I mean, I, I recall when I became a Christian in 1971, um, th- th- it was very difficult for me to find any church. I lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was largely charismatic and moderate Southern Baptist It was really hard to find a church in my city where the pastor opened the Bible and preached. Uh, One of the one of the bright spots on the horizon for me is it's not so hard anymore. There are a lot more, I think, uh, pastors out there, young men out there who actually are committed to biblical exposition. It's much easier. It's by no means easy, but much easier than it used to be to find a church where you get biblical exposition. A lot of that is owing to the labor of you men, and I appreciate that. What would you say, as you look at the future, gives you the most hope about evangelical Christianity? Well, the the, the most hope are the very kinds of things we're talking about at this conference that we've already heard about in the talks that have been given, and, and I'm sure we will. If I can just push on your last topic, just to give you the controversy you want, uh, I think... <laughs> I. Th- Brothers, I think talking about race does not create racism. And the more white Christians that learn that, the better it will be for us honestly looking at our own history. I think there are, I don't know if everybody my age gets that. I think the generation behind us all knows that. Now, are there bad ways you can talk about race? Of course there are. Are there divisive ways you can talk about race? Of course there are. But it's just a fiction 
to say that racism doesn't exi exist except for us talking about race. And I think expositional preachers who do like what Ligon did at last year's T4G, which I thought was a model of a good way to deal with this biblically, I'm not saying that about every message, I'm saying about Ligon's message. <laughs> uh, I think that was an advance and is going to help us in, in pronouncing and promoting and preaching the gospel in the generation to come. Let me ask you something. That, this is not to push back, but... I did it so you could push back. All right, well, do Because Al was being encyclopedic and fair, I, I don't, and I'm going to be more like I you. I don't and disagree with the statement. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with the statement that to talk about race doesn't necessarily inflame racism, but, but I don't think the, the, the racial situation in our culture has gotten better over the past two decades as opposed to worse. I, I think there's probably more strife right now than there has been in, in the years I remember. Well, I, I think that is true. But I think if I am sitting there, because I've got, I've got you know, a good number of African-American members in my congregation that I listen to, and when I listen to their stories, they perceive an advance in the culture at large is understanding of what they have faced and are facing. And I think that's good. That's also, that's also honest, uh, as opposed to the dishonest idea that um, everybody's a racist and we're all being oppressed. And again, you're back to the same thing. We, we want to deal with reality and we want to speak to reality and love that person that, that understands that without buying into all the power grabs that are coming yeah. that are unrealistic. And yeah. that's, that's that line. And that's why Al is saying, you know, you can speak about it all the time, but you're always walking that fine line between dealing with the people who need to be loved and cared for and the people who are trying to gain power yeah. by creating something that doesn't exist. So John, a very practical pastoral example. When, uh, when I was talking to one family in our church and they were explaining to me what it was like for their, two, their African American, for their two sons to get their driver's licenses in Illinois. Uh, and the, the mom was explaining to me that when they got their driver's license, they had a very serious conversation. They sat them down in their living room and explained, son, this license could get you killed. And they didn't mean because of driving, you know, fast and the kids didn't drink. It's because you could be shot if you don't do exactly what you're told. They weren't on TV. They weren't on CNN. This was a Christian family in their living room with a matter of utter seriousness that it's parents loving their kids. I, I've got family after family after family after family that with no malice, not trying to do anything politically, recounts their experiences like that. So that's the world that I live in as a pastor and I think the Christian gospel has tremendous resources to learn from and to help and to push and to, to help us as a whole understand things like that, listen to each other, and as our church covenant says, bear each other's burdens and sorrows. Yeah, there's a, there's a comparison that continues to be disturbing to me, and that is the agreement in talking about that and not ever saying anything about abortion. Yeah, I agree, brother. So in, in our own church, uh, I said to some guys, did I say this last night? My message, I can't remember. But I, uh, in my sermons, I tend not to be that controversial. Now, abortion is not con controversial in our congregation. You, you cannot be a member of our church and support abortion. Uh, you know, but Phil and I were talking the other day about are there any Democrats left who are opposed to abortion. Well, there are, there are, there are probably lots of them, but are there any elected officials? Man, that's getting harder and harder. So we had an elected Democrat official who was a member of our church, and he began to, because he'd just become a Christian, began to push against the current LGBTQ positions and abortion, and basically he couldn't even run for re-election because the primary. So what I tried to do with kind of trying to have a bipartisan church witness on Capitol Hill in the 1990s when the, you know, the Democrats are pa passing the Defense of Marriage Act is a world harder today in 2019 because as, as bad as the Republican Party may be about a lot of things, 
the Democratic Party is being even worse, especially on that issue like abortion. Yeah, so in my pastoral prayers, I will tend to pray very aggressively about issues like that. There, even within the African-American community, there's more eagerness to talk about the, the, the oppression than there is to recognize the abortion. Um, in, in the conversation, I did a funeral uh, for a precious family, uh, lost a little boy to a genetic uh, illness. And I, I said, the, the good news is that the little ones go to heaven. And I said, given the number of abortions that are taking place, and this is an all African-American service, um, we, can, we can thank the Lord that he gathers the little ones home. People actually stood up and walked out. They, they left the room, and I said, I'm, I was a babe in the woods. I figured everybody would thank the Lord for that. Um, and afterwards, I was accosted very strongly, and basically the message was, you don't talk about that. You don't talk about that. But You're welcome to talk about that at our church, John. Well, yeah, I know that, and of course, I know that, of course, but uh, we, we've... We can get squeezed, and that's why it's hard to know where to walk on this. I don't want to go into a funeral and offend half the people. Well, and I would just want to say there are a lot of African-American churches where I think you could talk about that. Oh, absolutely. You know, okay. what, you know what happened? The younger generation walked out. The older generation came to me and thanked me. And they thanked me. The fact that of the same family, the younger generation were hostile, and the parents came to me and thanked me. I think we have to talk about the family issues. I think we have to talk about abortion issues. And then we have to pour our love into those people that legitimately need our, our love and care. And uh, to sort that out is the challenge from the people who are just looking for power, or money, or whatever. Again, not as a matter of pride, but just as a matter of fact, uh, there is no living evangelical who comes close to the amount of tension in words and argument sustained over years than I've given to this. But it does take a little longer conversation than we often get into. So if you're looking at the issue of African Americans and abortion, remember that when Jesse Jackson emerged as a, uh, an activist, he was not only anti-abortion, but was making the argument that abortion is genocide of unborn black babies. That all changed when he ran for president and accepted the rules of the Democratic nomination process. It's still true. Uh, on the briefing some time back, I talked about the fact that in New York, there were more African-American babies aborted than born. And we are that society. We have to recognize the disproportionate effect of abortion in the African-American community. We also have to understand that white Republican liberals in the 1950s and 60s encouraged legal abortion because they saw it as a way to deal with the problem of too many babies from the wrong kind of people. And that's extremely well documented, including the fact that President George H.W. Bush's father, Prescott Bush, was the chief fundraiser for Planned Parenthood and names that are brand names, I'm not associating President Bush with it, nor his son, but the grandfather. So in other words, there's a pedigree here. So we have credibility, I would argue, as Christians to talk about this because we understand the dignity and sanctity of every single human life, born and unborn, from the moment of fertilization until the moment of natural death. And we also are the people who have to make clear we care black, about black babies outside the womb as well as inside the womb. So we've got to force these discussions on the terms that we believe are biblical and right. On some of the other issues here, I mean, again, just over the last few weeks, look at the attention I've given to identity politics. Identity politics doesn't work as politics, by the way, because you can't keep up. The left is entering into a nihilistic combat uh, to see who can be most intersectional and all the rest. It is, it is going to, it's not going to work. It's going to be a political disaster. But the biggest problem for us is that identity politics is a contradiction to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, 
our fundamental identity cannot be, first of all, as human beings, our fundamental identity is made in the image of God, and also in the fact that we have, again, you talk about taking a little bit more time, it requires an original mother and father from whom we are all descended. If you hold to modern evolutionary theory with multiple areas of humanoid development, you cannot have the dignity and equal sanctity of every single human life. So you got to have real creation. But then in the gospel, we are united to Christ at at the marriage supper of the Lamb, or or the vision of the book of, of, of Revelation. There are men and women from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. So that is not irrelevant, but that is not our primary identity. There is a part of God's glory shown in the fact that there are different tribes and tongues and peoples and nations, and that God's redemptive work is going to draw men and women from every single one of them, not one of them left out. But our identity is, first of all, in Christ. So the secondary identity is real, but it must be redeemed. And so this takes a little bit more argument. I'm trying through the course of my life to make that more argument. Um, That's where I hope to be found faithful. Phil, I am encouraged despite all of the circumstantial confusion that we're living in. I think maybe the last six to eight years of my life have been the most disconcerting of, really? of my whole life. Really? Just with what's happening in our, you know, the, 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 the public scandal and hypocrisy right. in government, church, Hollywood, culture in general it is unbelievably unnerving. Uh, and, and, you know, has, has caused tremendous skepticism of any institutional structures. Um, and yet, it is proof of Calvinism. Right. The, the doctrine of total depravity alone explains what we are seeing unveiled by God and his judgment falling on it. And so, as Calvinists, we stand back and we say, I give you... Okay, I'm, I'm serious. And no, I so, it. though, though, though it's unnerving to live in the midst of that, it's 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 God Most High saying, "This is what I told you in the Word." And this can is I how add it that is. as yeah. Calvinist, Calvinistic premillennialists, we say, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> So, so even even in that disconcerting thing, I, I do see God paving the way f- because the, the, the bad news has to precede the good news. And, and the culture has been saying to us, the bad news not, is not true. And it's, it's almost like the Lord has said, excuse me, you know, d- deny this. And it's, it's funny, relativists can't even deny this. I mean, me too doesn't exist on relativistic terms. It can only exist on universal absolute terms. And to which again, we say, uh, hello, we, we've been over here in the corner saying this. So it's, it's amazing how a relativistic culture is forced to acknowledge things that the apostle Paul said are universal realities in Roman chapter one. My so, brother, I didn't, I, sorry, I, I okay. just did interrupt you. No, I was gonna say, you just, you are right. You just keep giving idiots too much credit. Um, no, what I want to point out is you're exactly right. Moral judgment requires moral absolutes, but there are people around us making moral judgments who still reject moral absolutes. So what would be absolutely unacceptable for a Brett Kavanaugh evidently doesn't apply to the governor of Virginia, uh, or the lieutenant governor. And so, I mean, in other words, they still are relativists in their... I, I, so I'm agreeing with you on, again, it proves Calvinism, total depravity, it proves the Bible, but all around us are people who are still trying to make statements of morality while denying, undercutting the very possibility of doing so. D- totally agree with that. Nevertheless, what the culture wants is it wants the moral high ground. And you can't have the moral high ground if there isn't some sort of moral norm. And so, it is, again, what it does is you may look like the yokels in the eyes of the world, but they're actually playing out what you've preached from the Scripture. Um, and so just preach the Word into that. The second thing I would say is, with all of this blowback that I've been watching for six, eight years now, um, 
I still see big God theology growing here and around the world like never before. Uh, People are getting up and preaching the Bible in church. People are coming to faith in Christ. People are sharing the gospel. People are discipling people according to the scriptures. And I meet it everywhere I go on every continent around the world. And so, you know, I, I think, I think a lot of us have to be encouraged by what may be in the eyes of the world a day of small things in what we're doing. Who cares whether the world thinks it's small or not? Just keep doing it. That's right. And, and the Lord will, 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 will grow the seed. Um, I, could I interrupt just long enough to say, um, how are things going in Scotland? Well, as a representative of that nation, I've, I've kind of felt excluded for the last 45 minutes. <laughs> I, I, think, I think by a declaration that was made in 1776. <laughs> did, did you sign that statement? But, um, <laughs> No, I sent John Witherspoon to sign that (laughs) statement. We are somewhere between 20 and 50 years in advance, I think, of the United States in our decline. Um, How does it show up? In in everything. Um, A... It doesn't show up in the, the, the race issue is not quite the same as it is here. Uh, the sexual revolution is uh, uh, pushed by the Scottish government. The Scottish government is determined to be the most progressive country in the world in these areas to the point of a child of whatever age Uh, declaring themselves no longer to be a boy but a girl and uh, essentially the parents barred from any consultation Um, and this extraordinary breakdown in logical thinking that uh, under these pressures of power groups little children will be uh, encouraged to do things Whereas in every other area of their lives, they will be discouraged from making relatively modest decisions about themselves. Um, and my, my hope and prayer is that the cataclysm comes sooner rather than later. Because if it doesn't come sooner, we are, we are heading for the dark ages. And there is, I, I really believe there's an underlying thought in our culture in the United Kingdom. If we can get rid of the distinctives of the Christian faith, then we will get back to being the decent people, the free people we used to be. And most of our people do not know enough history to know that actually before the gospel came, we were pagans. You know, we're running around with blue paint. Um, as in Braveheart, which incidentally I've never seen, and I do not want your old DVD. <laughs> um, but it's uh, like Europe, I think it's a situation where when a, nation, when a nation has had the gospel and rejected it, it, uh, it, it doesn't at first realize it's it continues to borrow from the gospel. And as it chips away at what it has borrowed from the gospel, it does end up in a kind of moral nihilism and disaster. You see occasional signs on the horizon. There was, a, there was an article in the Times of London last year where one of the journalists uh, had an article, how much longer will we sacrifice our children to the transgender lobby? But that was the first time I'd seen in the press uh, any comment. The same week there was an article by a journalist who belonged to that kind of lobby who was saying, aren't things so much better? Isn't the world so much better? And, you know, I don't keep footnotes, but I wish 
I had surveyed, I, I surveyed the times every day since then. And I, and that was over a year ago. I don't think I have seen more than two hands full of headlines that would have made me think the world is even a decent place. The 90% of the headlines are about the, the cesspool of life that has emerged. And yet there is such a blindness that, that this is not... So we, are, we are in desperate need. That said, um, I, you know, I find myself saying often to people, um, we, are, we are living more like the New Testament than in our country we have lived for so long. We need not be pessimists. The gospel will prevail. Plus, these are days in which uh, living churches under the ministry of the Word are being built, and these are so remarkable to people that when they're exposed to them, they consistently say, I did not know that church was like this. And so the church, I think, is becoming like the one divine community in a, a, in a, in a, in a, a community that has rejected God that, that will shine like a light in the dark place. And you know, those churches are being built. They're small. You need to know where to look, but they are real. And uh, I belong to one of them, and it's a, it is a thrilling thing to see. We are way over time, and uh, so we need to close. Meanwhile, we pray for that uh, reformation that will change things exponentially, both in the church and in the culture at large. John, would you close us in prayer? Father, we thank you for the truth, for your word, for your spirit. Thank you for the promise that the Lord will build his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. We thank you that the promise of Scripture is that all that the Father gives to me will come to me and I will lose none of them but raise him up at the last day. We thank you that we triumph in Christ and we are so grateful to be called into this service. Uh, we are unworthy. We, we are, from a human viewpoint, incapable and unable but by your Holy Spirit, the gifts that we have been given and the empowerment from him and the word of God in our hands with diligent application from our hearts and minds to it, you have ordained that we can be instruments to change the world. And that is our prayer. Whatever little part that we can play, it doesn't have to be big, it doesn't have to be significant, it's enough to wear the uniform of Jesus Christ and march in the triumph with him. Uh, so give us satisfaction at whatever we have been called to do, in diligence and faithfulness. In his great name we pray. Amen.